I can hear one of them talking from one porch. The other said, look, what's happening? That old gal's running. One of her husbands must have got after her. She ain't even got her water pail. But pretty soon they heard her holler, come see a man, come see a man, come see a man that told me everything I ever done. He's down there at the well. Come see him. I can hear some of my old sisters that take the bread out, leave the churn. That if there's somebody down there I can tell that old gal everything she's ever done, we want to take a look at him. Because so she's done a lot of it. So what was Jesus teaching us here? He's teaching us that you can start now. And you don't have to have some great testimony. How you fell off a mountain, slid down it, and, and fell into the ocean, and sharks got after you and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to have no kind of store like that if you could just learn to say, come see a man. He's got the answer. He can supply the need. He can save you. He can deliver you. Come see him. Come see a man. Well, in soul winning, that's really what you're supposed to say. Don't say, come over to see our pretty church and hear our good Evangelist, come see a man. Come see Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to sing about him. We're going to worship him. We're going to preach about him. We're going to tell the world he's got the answer. All right, when can we expect, expect gifts to work anyway? you got a windmill out in your fields, and when do you expect it to turn? When the wind blows, don't you? what it was put up there for. When do you expect the gift to work? Let's take a look at the evangelist. Whenever the... Uh, I told him the evangelist was helping me in my class. He is getting happy. He is hungry for gifts. I said, boy, I said, if this was a whole house full of sinners instead of saints, your gift would work, wouldn't it? He said, boy, could I preach. If I had a house full of sinners, that's when the evangelist gifts work. When he got him a house full of sinners, let's get this and uh, this coming Friday night. Let's get him a house full of sinners because his gift will really work. When does the pastor's gift work? And ever saint, sir. And if you don't die, his gift is really going to work. got to worry about nobody they're all there and brother he can preach like a house of bar so when does gifts of healing work when there's a sick person or a house full of sick folks because you see Mary came to Jesus and said Lord this old boy is out of wine very embarrassing. He said, what's that to me? It's not my time yet. It's not quite time for me to start working miracles, is what he's saying. Quite time. But you know why he was pushed into it a little ahead of time? There was a need. Always remember that where there's a need, gifts will work. If there's a sick person, if you've got the tiniest little gift of healing, it'll work full force. Because there's a need. Jesus is always looking for that need. <clears throat> All right. Now, remember this. Use your gift or lose it. You better find a place to use it. Why should God let you keep it? He'd take it and give it to somebody else. The more the gift is used, the more effective and stronger it becomes. Fear is the greatest hindrance. Now, in Romans 15, 18, and 19, For I would not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient. Now, how did Paul get the Gentiles to be obedient? He was always having great revivals among the Gentiles. He tells us here, by word 
and deed. Not just preaching, but word and deed. And then he explains it through mighty signs and wonders. By the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. How? With word and deeds. With preaching and demonstration. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration. Everybody say demonstration. In demonstration of the Spirit and power. Why, Lord, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When the Lord begins to baptize with the Holy Ghost, that's the result of revival. You can shake hands with them, preach great sermons, just let them say, I believe Jesus Christ is Son of God. Anybody in the world can do that. But it takes an act of Almighty God to baptize with the Holy Ghost and the speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Brother, that's word and that's deed. Praise God. It takes God to open the eyes of the blind and unstop the deaf ears and make crippled limbs straighten out, waters and tumors disappear. It takes a supernatural act of God. And the Lord said, I want the supernatural. I want the manifestation of my spirit so that men won't just trust the brains of men, but they'll trust me. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is undeniable proof or evidence to make his show or ministry of force. Jesus proved he could heal a crippled soul by healing a crippled body. Which is the easier, he said, to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, before we close with prayer, just, uh, we mentioned prophecy here. Let me show you the difference here in foretelling and foretelling. Foretelling, Matthew 24, Acts 21, 9 and 10. Agabus told him there was a great drought coming. And uh, Jesus foretold uh, things that was coming. In other words, to foretell is to say tomorrow at 8 o'clock there will be an earthquake in a certain, certain place and it comes to pass. That is foretelling. But foretelling is saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh in the last days. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. That's foretelling. That's prophesying with the anointing things that's already written in here. It just comes forth with greater force when the anointing of Almighty God is there. Now the gift of the word of wisdom. Noah saw a flood coming 120 years in the future. Abraham saw the promised land many years before he got there. Through a word of wisdom, he, Jesus said, he saw my day. Talking of Abraham and rejoiced. Praise God. Moses, uh was given through a word of wisdom the complete structure of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the furniture in it, and everything that went with it. Uh, the Lord will do nothing but what he reveals to his, uh, reveal his secrets to his prophet. He always wants to help us. Now, in closing, how can I operate this gift that God's given to me. I'm scared. A minister called me long just a while ago. He said, every once in a while I get in, get in this dimension and things happen, but I can't stay in it. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, while we look not at things that are seen, but at things that are not seen. 
While we look not at the cancer, we look away to Pilate's hall where they were putting stripes on his back. And the prophet said, by his stripes, you're healed. That's learning how to look away from the things around about you into the spirit world. For the things that are temporal, they'll pass away. But the things that are not seen, they're eternal. You see, God's spiritual word is up in the heavens. It's eternal. And we get it to come down. If it's revival, if it's healing, whatever you quoting this scripture and looking into the invisible world, we look by faith at the invisible promise of God until it becomes a reality in the physical realm. That's looking beyond the physical by faith into the spiritual realm and holding that faith until suddenly it appears in the physical realm. You see, the healings in the, in the spiritual realm, revivals are in the spiritual realm, signs and wonders and miracles are in the spiritual realm, not in the physical. We, by faith, look into the spiritual realm and see the promise and claim the promise and then suddenly it appears in the physical realm. See, you look at that big high line, you don't see any electricity, but there's enough in that thing to light up big cities. There's a power going through that that you don't see. You'd think that much power far going through there, that wire would get red hot and burn to pieces. But this is electricity. It can be channeled. Now the atom is so small, you could put 10 million on the end of a needle and still not see them. It's so very small, yet one day our government, our scientists said to some more scientists, we've got to split an atom. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, you can't taste it, you can't feel it. None of your five senses can find it because it's invisible to the five senses. But I want you to find a way to capture it and to split it. Now that's quite a job, but they did it, didn't they? They did it. That was looking at things not seen, using mechanical earthly instruments to finally get it and channel it and split it with uranium. Here we are, physical human beings made in the image of God. With Him giving us invisible faith that can touch the invisible storehouse and bring it into this natural realm. And it's suddenly ours. You can have it if you believe for it. If you look away from the temple and look to the spiritual, the eternal, this generation shouldn't have any trouble believing in the invisible things because of the atom and because the whole world is disturbed now we might be destroyed city after city destroyed now the time has come for us to break into the spiritual realm I read in a US News and World Report today in New York City there are 30 thousand mothers with AIDS. They have an average of two children apiece. They'll be dead, the article says, in a year or two, with 60,000 children no place to go, and many of them with AIDS. They predicted